All right, so we are on our next chapter and Teddy was contacted by Summer and she said that she had a lead. So our next chapter is called Summer's Lead. Hmm. It turned out to be harder to make the appointment with Summer than I'd expected. For the first time in my life, Mom wanted me by her side all day. I don't want you running around Fun Jungle all by yourself, she explained as we headed to Monkey Mountain. It's too dangerous. Not during visitors' hours, it's not, I replied. No one's going to try and hurt me with thousands of tourists around. In truth, I wasn't completely sure this was true, but meeting up with Summer seemed worth the risk. It's not long term, just until security finds out whoever tried to hurt you last night. That might take weeks. What am I supposed to do? Hang out in your office all day? Maybe. Ah, uh, come on, Mom. You let me be by myself all the time in Africa, and there were tons of dangerous animals there. Mom grabbed my hand and stopped walking, wanting me to pay complete attention to what she was saying. This is different, Theodore. I know you could handle yourself in Africa because animals aren't really that dangerous. They rarely try to harm people unless they've been provoked. And even on those occasions, they're not that hard to scare away. But humans are different. If a human really wants to hurt you, he won't give up that easily. He'll keep coming after you. He'll keep trying new tactics until he finds one that works. What you've gotten involved in here isn't a game. This is dangerous and you have and you need to behave accordingly. Okay, I said. I meant it too. Until that point, I hadn't realized how worried mom was about me and her words got me more concerned about my safety as well. But from my point of view, meeting up with Summer to pursue her investigation was looking out for my safety. Mom might have believed we could trust Fun Jungle Security Force to find out who'd been behind the Mamba incident, but I didn't. First, they hadn't seemed too intent on investigating in the first place. Second, they weren't a real police force. Buck Grassley might have had some law enforcement experience, but most of his people didn't. Many didn't seem that much more competent than Large Marge, who could have found who couldn't find a crim who couldn't have found a criminal if he was mugged if he was mugging her in broad, broad daylight. So it made sense that the best way to protect myself was to find the bad guy before he tried to hurt me again. If Summer had a lead, it ought to be investigated, and unfortunately, there didn't seem to be anyone willing or capable to follow up on it besides us. Of course, I could tell I couldn't tell Mom any of this. I hadn't even told her in the first place that I met up with Summer again. She would have argued that our investigation stood a better chance of getting me into more trouble than getting me out of it. Moms are overprotective like that, even mine. So I pretended to be the perfect kid all morning. I went to work with Mom, stayed in her office, reading a book while she worked on her computer. Well, I tried to read a book. The truth was, I could barely concentrate. I was eager to see Summer again and find out what her big lead was. I had to be constantly on alert for a chance to sneak away. I'd never had, I'd never had time pass so slowly in my entire life. Worse, Mom spent an unusual amount of time in her office that morning. Most days, she'd been out working with the gorillas in one way or another, taking care of them in their private quarters or maybe observing them out in their yard. But not that morning. She just sat at her computer and didn't even take a bathroom break. As the minutes hand slowly crept towards 11, I was beginning to think I'd have to text Summer and say our meeting was off when I got an idea. One of Mom's innovations at Monkey Mountain was a camera grid. There were dozens of cameras in the exhibit which allowed her, or any primatologist, to monitor the animals from their computers. There were 30 in the gorilla habitat alone. There wasn't a place the apes could go and not be recorded. This was exciting for Mom, as it was the first time she'd ever been able to watch her subjects without having them knowing she was watching. As much as Mom could fade into the background in the wilderness, the gorillas never completely forgot that she was there, and that would inevitably have some slight effect on their behaviors. But the gorillas didn't know about the cameras. Obviously, being in a zoo affected their behavior too, but the exhibit at Fun Jungle was so well designed, Mom claimed it was as close to the wild as she could get without going back to Africa. There were also security cameras in the building, and all those could be accessed from the researchers' computers as well. I'd known about all of these before Buck Grassley had mentioned them the previous night, although I hadn't been aware that every building at Fun Jungle was as well wired as Monkey Mountain, or that all the cameras fed into a central security bank. Sometimes, when the gorillas were close to the glass of the exhibit, Mom used the security cameras to get a better view of them. Mom shared her office with another primatologist who was at the vet lab with the sick squirrel monkey that day. He'd left his computer on. I got on it and started surfing through the camera feed. It didn't take long to find a park guest breaking the rules. In fact, I had several moronic rule breakers to choose from. An obese man was blowing raspberries at the macaws. A 
skinny woman was trying to get a veterinarian's col colobus monkey to accept her hot dog, and a father was actually dangling his five-year-old daughter over the railing in a misguided attempt to let her pet a baboon. Thankfully, the baboon was smarter than the father and kept its distance. But the winner of the most annoying visitors were a trio of teenagers. They were banging on one of the gorilla exhibits, big the gorilla exhibits big gla plate glass windows riling the apes. Of course, there were plenty of signs telling them not to do this for fear of upsetting the animals, but they obviously wanted to upset the animals. They laughed and howled as the gorillas reacted to their idiocy. Tempo, the silverback male, stood on his hind legs, making aggressive postures while the female and children looked about agitated. A lot of tourists had gathered to watch. Most seemed to realize the teenagers were doing something that was wrong, but no one had the nerve to tell the jerks to stop. No one but my mother, that is. Hey, Mom, I said, look at this. She glanced over and was instantly filled with rage. Mom never liked to see animals being tormented, but she was extremely protective of her gorillas. As I'd suspected, she immediately snapped to her feet and stormed to the door. Stay here, she told me. I'll be right back. According to official Fun Jungle policy, Mom wasn't supposed to get involved in incidents like this any more than I was. She was supposed to call security, but she never did. I found it interesting that Mom didn't trust security to handle a couple of rude teenagers, but still thought they could find the criminal who'd come after me the night before. I waited 30 seconds after she'd left and then whipped the apology I'd written. I'd already written for her out of my book, set it on her desk, and slipped out the door. As I scurried toward the exit, I heard Mom giving giving a ruckus at the top of her lungs. At the risk of being caught, I doubled back and peered into the viewing room. The crowd of tourists had grown even larger, eagerly watching Mom berate the teenagers for their behavior. Though Mom was a physically imposing woman, she could really scare, she could be really scary when she got angry. The teens cowered under her gaze, looking like they were facing an escaped lion rather than a ticked off scientist. You think it's funny upsetting these animals? Mom roared. How'd you like it if you were trapped in a room and Tembo was banging on your window? Because if we could arrange that... The teenagers whimpered apologies and accused one another of having started the trouble. Mom had broken them quickly. It wouldn't be long before she were headed back to the office. I raced for the exit and my meeting with Summer. It's about time, she said as I came to the dumpsters. I thought you were blowing me off. Sorry, I gasped out of breath. I'd run all the way across the park to get here. I had to wait until my mom... Relax, I'm just busting your chops, Summer grinned. She was wearing a, ba a t-shirt, a baseball cap, and sunglasses rather than, rather than one of her trademark pink outfits. She was so well disguised that she hadn't been waiting, that if she hadn't been waiting in our secret spot, I might not have recognized her. Did you have to ditch your bodyguards again, I asked? Yeah, but not the way I did yesterday. They're still so peeved at me. There's no way I could have even brought me to the park today. Don't they work for you? <laughs> no, they work for my father. And if they want to keep me under lock and key all day, all, I, all they have to do is claim there's a security risk. So I had to give them the slip early. I ducked out of the house before breakfast. My bodyguards sit in the hall outside my room. So I went out the window and down the tre trellis. One of our cooks gave me a ride here in return for some autographed stuff he can sell on eBay. Summer twirled into her outfit, mimicking a fashion model. This is how I dress on the down low. I've been here all morning. No one's recognized me yet. It's been awesome. I even had to pay for my own ticket to get in. She was so excited it sounded as though she were talking about having gone swimming with sharks rather than merely visiting a theme park. All I could figure was, for all the glitz and glamour of her life, her life appeared to have, Summer had so few normal experiences that she found them incredible. Going a whole morning without being recognized seemed to be the greatest thing that she could imagine. How do you know they won't think you're, you've been kidnapped, I ask. Summer shrugged nonchalantly. I left a note. That makes two of us, I said. We ought to get going then. Pretty soon they'll have the National Guard looking for us. We slipped out of the dumpster area and headed quickly through the park, although not as quickly as to draw attention to ourselves. Where are we going, I asked. To see Larry the Lizard, she replied. Uh... I hate to break it to you, but he's not real. He's the cartoon, not the cartoon character, doofus. The guy who plays him. He's our lead. How? Remember yesterday at the Emporium, I said we could tell someone, we could tell something about who killed Henry from how they would killed him? Yeah, but you never got the chance to tell me what. You didn't figure it out? Dude, it's obvious. I've had a lot going on. Someone did try to kill me last night. Summer grinned, and I realized that. Once again, she was teasing me. Okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you that. Here's the deal. Whoever did it had to know something about hippos. Not necessarily. The way they killed Henry was awfully simple. 
It wasn't. Think about it. If you went up to just about anyone and said, how would you kill a hippopotamus? How many of them would say, give them peronotitis? I'll bet most people don't even know what peronotitis is. A normal person would have shot Henry or poisoned him or stuck some live wires in his pool and electrocuted him. But to feed him a bunch of filed jacks to poke holes in his intestines, would you have known that would kill a hippo? I felt embarrassed again. Although this time, instead of making me seem naive, Summer may had made me look stupid. How could I have not thought of that? No, I admitted. And you're Tarzan Jr. You grew up with hippos in your swimming pool, in your swimming hole. Whoever killed Henry knew their hippos, and not many people do. So this was probably an inside job. You think one of the keepers did it? Summer shrugged. There's a good chance, I guess. Then, then why are we talking to Larry the Lizard? Background. We need to... Summer trailed off in mid-sentence and suddenly veered to the side, yanking me behind a topiary, top, topiary bush shaped like Eleanor Elephant. She signaled me to stay still, then cautiously peered from behind it. What's wrong? I whispered. Is it the killer? Worse, she replied. Paparazzi. I peeked out beneath the top, topiary elephant armpit and saw a cluster of heavy set men with multiple cameras strung around their necks stampeding past. Luckily, they had another target in mind. A pitcher for the Houston Astros and his movie star girlfriend had just come through the front gate. Leeches, Summer growled. They've probably been lying in wait all morning. She made sure the cameras were all pointed away from her, then dragged me off in the opposite direction. We were now going back the way we'd come, which meant we'd have to circle all the way around Hippo River to get where we'd been going in the first place, wherever that was. <laughs> Summer was too annoyed to tell me. Instead, she stormed along, grousing about photographers. People tip them off, you know. Random people. Some people, someone at the, par at the park notices me. They call a magazine. The magazine gives them like a hundred bucks and says the jackal's down here. You try to do something normal, like go to dinner or a movie or even get ice cream. And the next thing you know, there are thousands of lights flashing in your face and all these greasy guys are shoving up against you, calling you names to make you angry. And within 30 minutes, there's, a le there's the least... There's the least flattering picture of you possible all over the internet and a million chat rooms are talking about whether you're not, whether or not you're fat. It's the worst thing ever. Yeah, I said. Back when I was in the Congo, kids our age were dying of malaria and malnutrition and half their families had been killed in the wars. But I'd say, thank goodness no one's taking pictures of us against our will. Summer wheeled on me. For a moment, I thought I'd really screwed up and ruined our friendship before it even got started. But then Summer broke into a big smile as though she appreciated me giving her crap. Okay, you're right, I'm a pampered snob. But if you think paparazzi's no big deal, let's see what you think when you have to deal with them. How's that supposed to happen? You know, the big shing day for Carnivore Canyon tomorrow night? Uh, yeah, it's only like the biggest party they've ever had around here. Wanna be my date? I didn't answer right away. I wanted to. The moment she asked, my immediate impulse was to scream, yes! But it all seemed wrong somehow. Summer McCracken couldn't have invited me. It had to be a joke. She was teasing me again. Summer, su su Summer suddenly burst into laughter and I realized I was blushing. Whoa, she said, it's not a date date, okay? My dad's coming back to town for it and I thought you'd want to meet him. Oh, I said, trying not to feel too deflated. Of course, that'd be great. We'll try to get Daddy away from everyone and tell him about Henry being murdered, Summer explained. You haven't told him yet? He's halfway around the world and he's busy. Plus, I figure if I tell him solo, he might think I've been drinking my cough syrup. But if you're there to back me up, maybe he'll buy it. So what do you say? Want to come? Yeah, of course, I said. Though it seemed to me that someone has... Someone as invested in his daughter's life as J.J. McCracken would give her the benefit of the doubt if he... If, if she told him his mascot had been killed. I wonder if Summer was keeping our investigation a secret so she could play detective, but then got upset at myself for doubting her. After all, she was offering to tell her father the truth and get me into a swanky party to boot. Looking for ulterior motives to explain her behavior wasn't cool. I guess I was still having trouble believing someone like Summer really wanted to be my friend. I'm not kidding about the paparazzi, she told me. We'll try to avoid them, but they'll be everywhere, like mosquitoes. You'll end up all over the internet. I shrugged, trying to make it seem like I didn't like the, didn't think this was such a big deal, but deep down, I had to admit, I was a little excited about the prospect. I can handle it. We'll see. Why are you going to talk to Larry the Lizard? I asked. 
Summer smacked her forehead. Oh, right, I totally forgot. Okay, the way I found him was, I was trying to get some information on all the hippo keepers, you know, to see if anyone had a grudge against Henry. I'd heard he'd attracted one of them, right? So my father's got this whole database on his computer with everyone at Fun Jungle's info. That's how you got my cell phone number? Exactly. And your dad lets you use it? Of course not. He has no idea I use it. But then that's his fault for using my birthday as his access code. Anyhow, I found out there's four keepers who work with hippos, but they all seem cool. Each one has like 15 years of experience with hippos. The guy who got bit, he did hippo research for two years in Bot Botswana. That doesn't mean he didn't kill Henry. I know, but they've all been doing this a long time. Sooner or later, a keeper's got to expect to get bitten by something, right? That's the name of the game. If you want a safe job, you become a secretary or something. You don't work with hippos. It doesn't make sense that one of them would have to kill him for revenge. There could have been another reason. Possibly, but get this. While I was going through the database, I came across this other guy, Charlie Cor Connor. Did you ever hear that Henry was in the circus before he came here? Yeah. And that when he was there, he bit a clown? I heard he bit three of them. Well, Charlie is one of them, so I figured maybe I should talk to the guy. The guy not only knows Henry's background, but he also has a motive. You think a clown would kill for revenge, but not a zookeeper? Absolutely. Clowns are weird. Plus, this guy didn't choose to work with the animals. He just got attacked by one. That, my friend, is a recipe for revenge. So you call them up? Sure, he answered right away. Of course, the caller idea, D, told him J.J. McCracken was calling, and everyone answers when my father calls. Was he disappointed when he found out it was you? I didn't tell him it was me. I said I was my father's, it was my father's office, and we were looking into Henry's death. And the first thing he, had, thing he says to me is, I didn't do it, but I know who did. I was so surprised, I almost tripped over my own feet. He does? Who? I don't know. He wouldn't tell me on the phone. He was all paranoid, like maybe he's afraid the killer is going to come after him next. But that's why we're going to see him. So do you know if it... So how do you know if it's not another trap? Summer's steps faltered ever so slightly. She'd been so proud of herself to get the lead, it apparently hadn't occurred to her that this might be a setup. But then she shrugged it off as if it seemed as if she seemed to do as she seemed to do with so many things. If it is, then I guess we'll know something important. What's that? That Charlie's the real killer. She grinned, thinking this was funny. I didn't. After all, no one had tried to kill her yet. But before I could point this out, she yanked me down a small alley between two exhibits. There, a tunnel plunged us into a side building, the entrance to the mascot's dressing room. There weren't any doors because most of the costumes were too bulky to fit through them. Zelda Zebra was sauntering in ahead of us. Here goes nothing, Summer said, and she slipped inside. We'll have to see if the lizard knows what he's talking about, or maybe he's guilty or he could be setting them up and trying to kill them again. You'll have to keep listening. Thanks for, for listening today, guys.